Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, the first of our um, bite-size education sessions of 2022. In fact, it's our first ever bite-size education session. So a huge welcome um, to everyone who's joined us. I'm Catherine and I'm Director of Services and Support at Bowel Cancer UK. And I'm Claire Coughlin and I'm the Clinical Lead here at Bowel Cancer UK. So before we plunge into the, the main event, um, there's just a little bit of housekeeping for me to run through with everybody. Um, so please bear with me. This is where you can make sure you're comfy and get a cup of tea. Um, the event today is being sponsored by Merck. Um, and so just to let everybody know that Merck have provided us with a restricted medical grant to support this event, and they've had no input whatsoever into the agenda or the content of this virtual meeting, um, but they are paying for it, which is great. So thank you to them. Um, there are just a number of sort of um, things to point out to you. It looks like quite a few of you have already discovered the chat box um, because I can see you introducing yourselves and, and saying hello and the staff team behind the scenes are also there to um, ask questions and to prompt um, with you know as, as the speakers go through their presentation. We also at the bottom of your screen near where you find the chat box you'll also find um, two speech bubbles marked Q and A. So that's where we'd like you to put questions that you have for the um, speakers during their session. If you put your question in the chat box we can't see them um, whereas if they go in the Q&A bit then we absolutely can make sure that we we ask as many of them of the speakers as possible we will do our best to get through all of those questions however if there are some that either we're not able to answer today because time is against us or because um, they're just too complicated and we we need to go away and, and consult some experts then we will make sure that we get the answers out to you after the event we are recording today's event, um, so you'll be able to watch it again afterwards, um, and also any colleagues of yours who aren't able to join us today will be able to catch up with it later on our YouTube channel. Um, and as usual, at the end of the event, we will be emailing you with an evaluation form, which we would um, love your feedback. The content of, of the Bite Size programme for this year has been entirely built around the feedback that those of you that attended the NCCNN study day last year gave us around the sorts of topics that you wanted us to cover, which is why we're starting with genomics. Um, so it's really important to us that you tell us what, what else you want to hear about and we can, we can build that into the programme. So just to get everybody awake and focused, we've got a couple of poll questions to ask you, a bit of interaction. I love to know where around the I'm going to say world because in the past yeah. we have had people Could be from, anywhere yeah we have had people from Hong <laughs> Kong join us before so our first poll question is asking where are you joining us from today so if you can have a, a quick vote oh you can't vote you see if you're out of the UK but you never know lots okay. in England Loads come on England. four nation come on Northern come Ireland come on Northern Ireland you can do it come on Scotland and Wales are covered here anyone from Northern Ireland no. no, no. OK, brilliant. So vast majority of people um, in England with with some joining us from Scotland and Wales. Great. OK. And then our second poll question. Is oh, apologies, our second poll question is who is watching? So we know that for some of you it might just be you, but we also know that there might be a little cluster of, of people in the staff room or in an office. Um, so we just want to get a, a little indication of, of how many people are actually joining us. So we've got some some solo viewers. Quite a lot quite, of solo. But quite a lot of people in a gang of four or more. Yeah. I wonder who wins. It's, wonder, a, bit, it's a busy many, office, yeah. bless you. There yeah. you're, you're in a busy office. That's what I think about that. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. I think we are pulling again towards the end of the um, uh, towards the end of the presentation. So um, we will see you then. OK, Claire, over to you. Thank you. OK, so this is the first event I've been here for as clinical lead, and I could not be more delighted about this topic. Um, part of the joy of our speciality um, of colorectal cancer is the ever-changing landscape of clinical practice. That's one of the things that has always held my interest, but it is also the challenge. Um, and over the past couple of years, um, or, or a little bit before that, genomics has started to impact the advice that we need to give to our patients, but also the treatments that are available to them. 
Um, so I'm absolutely delighted um, that the, everybody said last year that this was the event that they wanted to be held and that this is the first of our bite-size events. So without further ado, I will hand back to Catherine, who's going to um, introduce our fabulous speakers. Thanks, Claire. Very excited um, about, about learning something this afternoon. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to our two expert speakers this afternoon. We have Dr. Terry Porritt, who is a strategic project manager. Previously, Terry has worked as a nurse consultant and was clinical director of the Northeast London Bowel Cancer Screening Centre. And she's being joined, and you can see her now, by Vicky Cuthill, who is lead nurse manager um, at the St Mark's Centre for Familial and Intestinal Cancer. So a huge welcome to Vicky and Terry, and I'm going to hand over to you. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know Vicky and I are really, really excited about today's event. Um, we've, we've had a practice, so I'm hoping we're going to be really slick. You're going to be impressed. Um, so, Vicky, could you go on to the first slide, please? That's it. Next one. OK, so this is giving you just a brief overview of what today is going to uh, going to look like this hour. So I'm going to position, if you like, this session, bearing in mind I'm a nurse, not a gen geneticist. And actually the word genomics, I have to say, does fit fill me with some fear. But I'm going to be exploring our scope and the role of the clinical nurse specialist. Um, then Vicky, thankfully, who is a genomics fellow, is going to be talking to us about genomics in cancer care. We're going to have time for questions and discussion, and then we'll talk about next steps and the second session will be running around genomics and actually the content and what you need to see. Next slide, please, Vicky. So I am, I'm a nurse. And I do describe myself as a bit of a dinosaur, to be quite honest, but I'm not, I wasn't around when this gentleman from the Royal College of Physicians defined what a nurse should be, that she should have technical skill gained by long practice and knowledge to carry out intelligently the direction she gets from a doctor, that the nurse has to be nimble of hand, but implicitly obedient, um, but it does not give scope for the higher power of the mind. Now, Vicky, next, next uh, animation on this, please. Um, now, this is a picture taken on the doorstep of uh, a nursing home at the London Hospital where I trained. OK, but I started my training in 1979, and I can assure you neither Vicky nor I are in this photograph. But actually, the world has changed hugely since I started my nurse training in 1979. In fact, on my first ward as a student nurse, I couldn't quite understand why the sisters were getting into such a fuss about the fact that nurses for the first time were going to give IV drugs. I heard comments like, if I wanted to spend all day in the treatment room drawing up drugs, I'd have been a pharmacist. That's not why I became a nurse. But now none of us would actually debate the fact that giving IV drugs is an integral part of our role. And whilst we're giving those drugs, we're understanding from the patient, their understanding of their treatment, their understanding of the side effects or possible complications of their drug treatment. So it's absolutely integral. So despite the fact that probably certainly when I started my nurse training, genomics wasn't uh, evident in medical or nursing care. Um, that does not mean that as a practicing colorectal nurse now, it actually does need to be something I am really, really familiar with, not least because you will have patients and their families who are anxious, who need your explanation and support as they go through um, blood tests and screening programs to ascertain risk for themselves and for their family. So with that in mind, I think it's really important that we uh, put our fear aside, and I certainly am frightened, I, I think, of, of, about the technicality of uh, what genomics means. But actually, when we open our ears and listen to Vicky, um, she will show us that 
actually what we need to know is is manageable without a degree in genomics and actually will be integral to the support we offer our patients. So Vicky, with no further ado, next slide and over to you. Oh no, I forgot, it's the poll, Vicky. I forgot, my fault. We've got a poll. So we really, really like to know your understanding of your confidence in genomics. So if I was answering this poll now, I, in all honesty, would click one, not confident. Um, this poll is anonymous. We know how many people are answering them, but not what answer individual people give. So please do be honest with how confident you feel about this subject at the moment. We'll repeat this um, at the end of the session, but also we will um, uh, allow, use this information and your questions to build the content into session two so that it really does meet your learning needs. Um, and now, Vicky, I think that's um, over to you. Thanks, Terry. Um, and have we got the answers up for the poll? Oh, here we go. Here we go. There we go. Yeah. Oh, so that's, that's, that's pretty good, actually. So just for 50%. Um, don't feel at all confident, but hopefully by the end of uh, my presentation, I can change uh, some of those uh, some of those opinions. So I'm just going to spend the next sort of 30, 35 minutes um, just giving out a high level overview. I can't tell you everything about genomics um, in the you know in such a short period of time, but I think some of the topics that are really important is demystifying the language. If we can't get to grips with this topic, then how can we expect our patients to get to grips with it? And actually, if our patients don't understand it, then they are not going to be able to be equal partners in their care, and they're not going to be equal partners in making decisions about that care. So it's really important for those reasons. Um, and I'm going to go through some of that language. Then, of course, how is it that this topic can help us lead um, to improve our knowledge and get us to understand and lead to better uh, and earlier diagnosis with better treatments. Moving on, I'm then going to make a distinction between the genomic variation that we see within uh, a tumour or a cancer and the uh, genomic variant variants that we can find in every cell and can lead to inherited disease and in the case of cancer, uh, cancer predisposition syndromes. And finally, I'm going to give a couple of examples um, of those and what we might see um, in clinical practice. So what does it all mean? And I think um, I don't want people to be um, overly stressed by this topic. Some of the language that's used is quite historical. Um, it might have been de derived you know, by um, scientists that aren't necessarily working um, with the patient. And it's down to us to kind of get to grips the, with the bits that we need to get to grips with and then explain things to our patients. So there's a lot of debate about what we should use, genomics, genetics, genomics. But actually, we just need to see it very simply. Um, you know, when we started to learn more about this topic, we would look um, at the study and function more of, of single genes or specific areas of genes, um, and, and we term it genetics, looking at just small sections. Genomics really refers to the whole thing, um, and it's the organism's complete set of genetic information, bits that code um, for making us who we are and for disease, and bits that don't. Um, so it's all of it. Um, in its entirety. So if you're not sure what to say, um, genomics is absolutely fine. And demystifying that language and not being afraid of that language is really, really important, especially for nurses. So I've just got a few slides just to take us back to our, um, maybe our biology um, GCSEs or A-levels and to think back to what we can see at the cellular and molecular level. So hopefully, Everybody is really familiar with that structure um, of DNA. Um, and I've got a, another picture in just a moment um, with that famous helical ladder-like structure. And a gene is simply a section of DNA. And when we think of chromosomes, they just contain all that genetic material tightly coiled up, and then they are positioned in the nucleus um, of the cell. Um, and 
If we look at it in another way, that's just another um, pictorial of it, you can see a section of a gene there, tightly wound into a chromosome. And some of you will have heard the analogy, which I really like, and which is the way I learned, about this topic being a bit like thinking about the recipes um, in a recipe book. So if we look at the actual um, rungs on the DNA ladder, they are actually composed of what we call as base pairs. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as nucleotides. And you can also think of those as the building blocks. And they form the letters of the genomic alphabet. And it's really easy because there's only four letters. And they always pair in the same way. So adenine always pairs with thymine, guanine always pairs with cysteine, cystosine, sorry. So think of those as the letters. And then what happens is those letters form into groups of three. Think of those as the words in your sentence or in, in your recipe book, the words in your recipe book. So actually what happens is these three rungs, and you can just see one half of the rung there, because obviously the other side is always tied, um, as I showed in the previous slide. So those three group together and they code for certain amino acids. And you can see that a certain grouping will start off the beginning of forming um, a gene and a protein. And then you'll have certain groupings that form certain amino acids. And you'll have certain groupings that when we need to stop that um, chain being formed, they'll put that um, stop in there. And they are simply groups for the words. And those words will form together in certain ways um, and they will make the genes or sentences. Um, and then they will go into the chapters which is your chromosomes. That is a really, really simple way of viewing it. And you don't need to go any deeper than that. You can if you like. There's lots of educational videos and materials um, that you can use to learn more about this. But this is a really simple way, I think, and a really nice way to explain it to our patients. So how is it that things can then go wrong? Well, very, very simple changes can make a big difference in some some, sometimes, and sometimes they can make no difference at all. So what you're seeing again here is you're seeing the rungs on that ladder. And here you can see that a simple substitution. So a cystocene has been substituted by thymine. And when that happens, in some instances, the triplet grouping, it won't make any difference. Sometimes it will code for the same amino acid, nothing will happen, nothing will occur, no problem at all. But sometimes that single change can make all the difference and can cause disease. So if you think of an analogy, um, one that, again, I was always taught was think of a jam sandwich. So you've got your jam. It's the, 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 it starts with a J. Well, if you suddenly substitute that J for a H, you've got a ham sandwich. And that is an entirely different kettle of fish. So I can't go through all the different ways today of how gene changes cause disease. But what often happens in cancer predisposition syndromes is that you have an alteration that occurs which actually forms a stop codon. So basically a change is made, which means that it codes for an amino acid, like I showed you in the previous slide, which brings in a stop. So you've got a prematurely truncated or shortened gene, which means that the protein can't form properly and that can cause really big problems in patients. So another way of looking at it, and there's, you know, there are other, as well as looking straight down, looking at nucleotides, those bases and seeing mistakes, there are lots of different ways actually uh, that disease can occur. So we know that certainly in cancer, we can have single gene causes that predisposes people to getting cancer, these in so-called inherited conditions. But actually we know from other bowel conditions, like for example, inflammatory bowel disease, that there can be multifactorial reasons for getting disease. Sometimes there can be multiple gene causes and they, coupled with things like the environment, um, can uh, cause disease in patients. And there can also be big structural changes. So, for example, you could be missing a bit of your chromosome, or you might have an extra bit, or even an extra whole chromosome. And, and Down syndrome is a good example um, of a, a chromosomal condition. So there's lots of different reasons um, why uh, genetic uh, disease and conditions can occur, uh, but also remembering that normal 
genetic variation is just that as well. So you can have changes which actually make us who we are uh, and make us so that we look different, for example, otherwise we'd all look exactly the same. So we're mostly, we're mostly 99% uh, genetically the same and those differences uh, make us look different, but sometimes can introduce disease as well. So one of the reasons why it's so, so important that we all become engaged in this topic is actually cancer is a disease of the genome. So if we are a group of cancer nurses, cancer healthcare professionals, to say that we don't need to know about this topic, um, it's a bit of a misnomer because actually at the molecular level, down at the cellular level, the reason that cancer developed in the first place is that genetic variation is introduced, which is harmful and which causes cancer and more on that in just a moment. And we can see that most cancer just occurs as a result of us getting older and being introduced to different types of carcinogens. Um, but we all know uh, that cancer can run in families, even if we don't have a specific gene alteration. Uh, we all, I'm sure, have family members that have had cancer. And depending on the paper you read, between 5 and 10% of all cancers um, have uh, an inherited component. So. Why, why is it that genomics is important? How can it help us improve um, care to our patients? Well, I thought this was a helpful way of, of looking at things and seeing that actually at the moment it's used anyway in every part of the cancer journey. And I think we need to remove the idea of genomics as up there and something that we need to understand and bring it back down into the patient pathway. It is simply a piece of the overall jigsaw puzzle, just like Knowing about chemotherapy is important in terms of that pathway. Knowing about what happens when somebody goes for a colonoscopy. Knowing a little bit about the surgery that's going to happen to the patient. This is another part of the puzzle that we need to understand in order to be able to explain things properly to our patients. I'm going to go a little bit um, after this, just talk briefly about liquid biopsies. Um, so I won't go too much about how they can be, be used in, in prevention and, and surveillance. But we know that if we can pick up, for example, in a bowel cancer, somebody who might be at risk of Lynch, uh, then that could um, make a very big difference to their treatment and also uh, to diagnosing family members. Uh, early detection uh, and also prevention is vital. We know it's in the 10 year cancer plan. It's part of lots of national um, uh, uh, transformation programs at the moment. We'll go into a little bit more about this in the next session. And we know that if we sequence a cancer, then at the moment, although it's limited, we are able to guide treatments, especially in metastatic um, cancer. And certainly with the advent now of things like DPYD testing, um, we can alter drug treatments uh, to suit patients as well. So this is a really famous um, paper. I'm sure most of you will have seen this infographic before. Uh, it's from Nature 2009, but um, uh, this is what I was taught on. And I, I just think it's such a great way of showing how cancer can develop uh, through our lifetime. So as I explained, you've got in the background all these mutation processes occurring all the time. And quite often, these will simply be what we call passenger mutations. They don't cause any problems at all. But we can also be exposed in our lifetime to environmental factors, UV rays, um, smoking, drinking, things like that, that can um, expose us uh, to mutations. And then we can have these so-called driver mutations. So, for example, if you have a, um, a mutation in, say, a tumor suppressor gene, for example, uh, then, you know, that may mean that um, cancer, which is basically unchecked cell growth uh, can then uh, be allowed to occur. This cellular change can accelerate and, and you get cancer. And then once you have cancer, we know that cancer is, is really clever. We give it very um, posh names, like we talk about the clonal evolution of cancer. That's just a posh way of saying cancer is clever and we can give chemotherapy that sometimes cancer then uh, the, the 
it can mutate, that the, the genetic variations can change so that it is able to withstand that chemotherapy treatment. And that's why we need to know about this because the more we know about how the cancer changes, maybe we'll be able to change treatments in the future uh, as cancers um, uh, carry on growing. Uh, and it means that um, we can keep changing treatments and, and we can give people better prognosis. Um, so that's just a really lovely um, uh, way of describing that. And again, this is not a slide to stress you out. Do not worry about some of the funny letters that are on this slide. This is just now to go slightly deeper into this and think about bowel cancer itself. And to think this again, we're talking about the cellular level right down to um, you know, looking at things under the microscope. You'll hear it referred to as, we're looking at things at the molecular level. This is what they mean. And actually we've all heard of the adenoma carcinoma sequence. And this is just a pictorial way of saying that there are different routes to somebody's bowel cancer. And knowing about that is really, really important because it can mean that different genetic changes have occurred to get to that endpoint of cancer. And knowing what those genetic changes are can potentially be really important for treatment. So A is your normal, the majority of sporadic cancer. And what's interesting with that is that you'll see APC loss there. So in a, a sporadic cancer, a cancer that's occurred as we age, um, there will be all these um, APC mutations. But actually, as I'll talk about later, if you get an APC mutation in every cell of your body, you've actually got familial um, adenoma polyposis. And the reason we know about all these changes in sporadic cancer is those patients. And we owe a lot to some of our patients with inherited cancer. Underneath that, we've got um, the microsatellite instability pathway, uh, which tells us, um, again, um, an inherited predisposition, a lot about Lynch syndrome. But when it's only in the cancer, um, it can also uh, tell us a lot because um, what we call a microsatellite high tumours um, are referring to this pathway. And we know, for example, that in metastatic cancer, immunotherapy can be a really helpful treatment for these patients. And then underneath that, um, you've also got another pathway, the serrated pathways. It's just to say that how we get to cancer and our knowledge about that is really important for how we treat people. So moving on to pharmacogenomics, it's really important to think that one size does not fit all in terms of all, obviously, um, our treatments. We talk a lot as nurses about personalizing our care, and that means tailoring treatments um, and tailoring uh, what we say to people um, to make sure that they feel that they are at the center of their cancer care. Um, genomics in medicine means tailoring treatment to make sure it's tailored to that person specifically. You know, I can see a future where we, um, uh, you know, uh, we look at a cancer as a bit like a genetic fingerprint um, and we sequence it and we alter, you know, everybody's treatment will alter. You've probably heard things like cancer vaccines, the idea that you can develop a vaccine for everybody that has cancer. I mean, this is talking really futuristic, but you can see how things may change um, in the future. So here we can see that we've got a big patient group, but actually for some patients, the drugs that we give are simply not beneficial and we don't want to give them, but for some they are. And it's about teasing out those groups and working out um, what are the best medications or in some cases when we should not give them at all. And in the case of uh, colorectal cancer, uh, we're thinking about DPYD testing. So when we're giving people 5-FU and capcitopin, we need to select out with a simple blood test, those patients that might be more susceptible to these drugs. Because if we can identify them, we can reduce or alter their dose so that they won't have such um, terrible side effects. And this is a very small proportion of patients at the moment, but it gives us an indication of what the future might hold. And again, I'm sure lots and lots of you have heard about the term liquid biopsy. It is in some small areas of practice at the moment. It's very, very expensive, but I'm confident that in time to come, this will be a big thing. Some of you will have heard about the GRAIL project. That is a study where they are taking healthy volunteers, taking blood samples and hoping to diagnose cancer at a far earlier stage before we can see it on scans, before we can see it on our 
for example, a colonoscopy and a polyp. Um, and that has real hope for maybe those hard to diagnose cancers like pancreatic cancer. And in terms of surveillance, that chart I showed you before, can you imagine, you know, by the time we diagnose metastatic cancer on a scan, uh, it, could have, it could have been growing for many, many months. I mentioned earlier about um, sporadic cancer, i.e. cancer that we've we've developed as we get older. Um, and it's important to remember that when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about um, variants or mutations that are only present in the cancer cells themselves. They're not present in every cell of the body, so they cannot be passed on to children. But as I've explained, sequencing a tumor um, can provide a lot more information about how the tumor might progress, for example, what are the best treatments, whether there are clinical trials the patient can enter, for example. So next time you look at that histopathology uh, report and you're seeing things like BRAF mutation, for example, we know that in metastatic bowel cancer, that actually uh, can lead to much poorer prognosis. But it's important for the patient to know that. And it's important for us to know that. So we're not going to give the patient the wrong drugs that, that can actually make what is left a really poor quality of life. And actually, um, uh, uh, the, the BRAF mutation um, can lead to an acceleration of the growth and spread of cells. And it's important to know that as well, because that is why it can lead to poor prognosis. And we can explain that to patients. And if we can do that, we might make um, their understanding and therefore their journey a lot easier. When we're thinking about inherited uh, cancer predisposition syndromes, that is where the mutation, as I've said before, is present in every cell. So you can then pass it on to your offspring. When we think about bowel cancer and inherited cancer, then it's important to remember that, of course, the majority of cases are sporadic and about 5% um, of bowel cancer is due to an inherited cause. But it's really important to pick that out because when we diagnose these patients, um, we're diagnosing not just them, but potentially family members. And so it has a really important um, aspect. So why is it important? We want to prevent cancer in an individual, but certainly we want to hopefully diagnose it earlier. If somebody prevents with, presents with a cancer, then we may be able to tailor treatment. And of course, in Lynch syndrome, that's really important because in metastatic bowel cancer, uh, in Lynch syndrome type cancers, which are microsatellite high, then we can offer immunotherapy. Family, family, family of vital importance. Um, and we can put people on surveillance programs, which is really important as well in preventing uh, people from getting cancer. So how do we um, identify people? Well, anybody under the age of 50, uh, maybe somebody, and I've put one primary bowel cancer there, but what I mean is one primary cancer, apologies. So you might have a primary bowel, somebody with a primary bowel and a primary womb cancer, and they are associated cancers, for example, in Lynch. So that would make us um, think and ask uh, more close uh, questions. Several close relatives diagnosed with bowel cancer and multiple bowel polyps. And I often think of the three, two, one, which is three individuals in the same family over two generations with one diagnosed under 50. You don't have to remember all this. In our next session, we'll talk about how you can get in touch with your regional genetic services um, so that you know the contacts to make if you're unsure. Really, it's about picking this up, asking the right questions and knowing where to signpost as well. So uh, I'm going to very briefly, uh, just for the last couple of minutes, talk about Lynch syndrome uh, and FAP. Lynch syndrome, uh, is a dominantly inherited condition. It's the most common of all cancer predisposition syndromes. There's lots of work going on with the uh, Lynch uh, transformation project at the moment. And this is really important for colorectal nurses uh, because um, I'm sure you'll be having far, far more conversations both in your MDTs and with your patients about this. And the reason that it causes cancer is that the genes are called mismatch repair genes. They've got an important role in DNA repair. So you can imagine if there, that there's a, a defect present the DNA is not repaired properly and cancer can develop. And it's not just bowel cancer. There's quite a number of cancers that are associated, but colorectal cancer is the most common. And Lynch-like is where we haven't isolated a particular gene, but there's a really strong family history. Um, and when we've done that special tumor staining, um, that immunohistochemistry or um, microsatellite instability staining, then we can see um, uh, that there is deficient 
MMR um, as well. So we haven't got a gene alteration there, but we treat the family as if they have Lynch syndrome. And we know that at the moment, only 5% of people know that they have Lynch syndrome. Uh, so it's really vital to pick these patients up. And just a quick word about dominant inheritance. So that means we have two copies of each gene, one inherited from our mother and one from our father. And we only have to have one affected copy to have a condition. And um, so uh, you can imagine if you're born with every cell in your body already on the pathway to cancer with an affected uh, uh, one part of, of that gene, then um, as you go through your childhood and you pick up more genetic variation, it's your, your pathway to cancer is much faster. And just a note on recessive inheritance, both copies of those genes have to be uh, affected for you to have a recessively inherited gene. And of all the inherited predisposition syndromes for bowel cancer, MUT-YH associated polyposis is the only one of those. Lots of things we can do with Lynch syndrome. We can give aspirin, lifestyle advice. We can offer um, uh, adaptive surgery. People, uh, women, when they've had their children, can be offered um, uh, surgery to reduce risk. Uh, and we can put people on surveillance pathways. So identifying people is really important in your um, uh, in the resources. Uh, and the infographic, this excellent handbook, really does explain things really well and shows you the pathways as well. So I do recommend that you look at that. I'm sure you already have. Um, and uh, this case study um, just gives a good example of what happens if we don't um, if we don't identify these people. So um, I had a 28-year-old man fairly recently with early onset colorectal cancer. He came to us for panel testing because it's a young age, but actually on talking to him, his cousin had died of bowel cancer three years earlier. She'd actually had the specialist staining that had shown a uh, deficient MMR, but she hadn't gone on to have genetic testing. There was a fault in that pathway, uh, which meant that the family weren't alerted to the Lynch syndrome that was eventually discovered. Uh, so you can see how vital we are in this pathway um, as well. FAP is probably the second most common, it is the second most common, but it is actually very rare. Again, it's the dominant condition caused by that APC gene mutation, but in every single cell uh, rather than just in the cancer cells. Um, and so that these patients have a nearly 100% chance of cancer by the time they get to 50. It's a multi-system disorder, but it's mostly affecting uh, the large bowel, and we offer preventative surgery for that. But patients also get polyps in the um, stomach uh, and the duodenum, uh, and may go on to have things like Whipple surgery, and they can also get extra chronic manifestations like desmoid tumors, not cancer, but can locally invade, and in extreme circumstances, patients may need uh, small bowel transplantation. So again, really important to identify these patients. And again, the effect of not doing so, 53-year-old patient with advanced colorectal cancer requiring pelvic exenteration. And um, actually he was estranged from his family, but he did know that there was something going on in his family. He actually died uh, after we had confirmed FAP because he became too unwell. But if the right cascade testing had been offered to his family, then he could have been prevented completely from getting that cancer. Um, and that is something that we really, really um, must work towards. So we're looking at an area uh, and working towards an area of personalized medicine that is going to be far more about tailoring things to individual patients and not just the one size fits all. And that preventative proactive approach uh, rather than, oh, now you've got cancer and now we have to treat it. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we were able to prevent it um, in the first place as well? So take home messages. I hope I haven't gone over my time too much, uh, but there are two genomes to consider, and often we get information from both, but there is the genome of the patient, so thinking on, in terms of inherited disease, uh, when you've got mutations in every cell of the body, um, and then of course there's the genome of the tumour, so just when you're looking at genetic variation within that tumour, and often we get information from both. Family, please, please, please never presume that somebody has asked about family history. It is a very much forgotten about thing and ignored thing. But also know your own family history because um, you know, that's also really important. Uh, and secondly, uh, there is something called a de novo uh, mutation, which is where you might be the first 
in the family to have a condition. So don't presume that if somebody has no family history at all, they don't have a condition. But I guess my overall message is that genomic medicine is integral to cancer care. It's at an early stage at the moment in what it can actually offer, but patients need to know about it. We need to know about it. Watch this space and come to our next presentation where we're gonna tell you lots more and apologies uh, for my connection errors uh, this afternoon. That's brilliant. Thank you, Vicky. And no worries. We, I think we, we heard everything that you had to say. Right, there's Terry. Wow. Me. Well, I've made so many notes, Vicky. I'm, I'm less frightened than I was before. Thank you. But I, can I ask one question or ask something? The absolute crux of what you said, so how you really sold it to me was cancer is a disease of the genome. If I've got cancer, colorectal, cancer, anything, nurse specialist nay, on my badge, this is my business. So, so that to me immediately made my ears prick up. Um, and also what I really, really liked, and I wondered if you would repeat, is the three, two, one. When you're talking about that important family history, would you just say three, two, one again, please? Because I think yeah. that totally nailed it. It was a way, because it's the way I learned, you see, because please remember that I do this all day, every day, but I didn't used to, I started somewhere. So three um, people in a family across two generations, one being under 50. And, you know, it does have to be associated cancers, but to be honest, I don't want people to get too bogged down in the detail do you know what I mean if you if you've heard something and you're not sure but you think oh gosh is that you know could that be something way better to ask nobody is going to think any less of you if it's not if it turns out to not be but if you don't ask and it is you've lost that patient and potentially that family and um, so three two one uh, but you know if you should feel anything at all concern then please ask um, and we can talk about how to get in touch with the right people maybe in our next session terry and um, so that everybody's got 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 that information and vicky you spoke also about an infographic so you very helpfully on your slides have have put some resources uh, at the end some um some references but actually you will be receiving by email and also i think there's a link in the in the chat as well to a um a very simple infographic that we've made which is basically a, a journey along uh, along understanding genomics so literally there are some really really helpful short but really informative videos podcasts and links for you to to work your way through this journey um, and I think if if you could do do the journey on the infographic before session two you will uh, that will really help um, us build on that information for you that's a very polite way Terry of telling everyone they've got homework <laughs> <Love it. laughs> just to get the best out of your time your time is precious as specialist nurses so to get the absolute value out of session two if you could have um done this short journey and some of them are great you can download them they're podcasts you can listen on your way to work or all this kind of thing so it's not uh, it's not hugely time onerous for you there's a fantastic take TED talk as well so yeah it, they're really engaging things it's not 17 papers that you've got to read they're they're engaging kind of resources so um, I learned uh, a lot from them I uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, seeing them and putting the infographic together uh, for for Vicky so they're brilliant uh, resources so do we have do we have questions we do. Yes, we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is from Jacqueline, who asks, what dose of aspirin do you recommend? Yeah, good question. And actually, there, is, and there isn't a simple answer to that because it very much depends on things like the age of the patient, things like their BMI as well. Um, so, for example, um, we usually recommend 75 milligrams a day, but you have to be careful of any existing comorbidities. Um, but if somebody um, uh, is uh, 
uh, quite large uh, and above a certain BMI, then we would double that to 150 milligrams. Um, there is a really nice um, uh, dis uh, patient decision aid on NICE, uh, which is for patients, um, but it's really helpful actually. And um, it talks about, uh, you know, goes on about how patients can be helped in whether or not to take aspirin. Um, but there, if you're interested, there, there is a, there has been lots of studies, the CAP study, C-A-P-P, um, and they've looked at really high doses of aspirin. So we're not talking about the usual 75, we're talking about, you know, 150, 300, up to 600 milligrams of aspirin a day for these patients. Now, the results, we're still awaiting the results, um, but it has been shown to have a, a protective um, element, but it depends on things like age, your weight, um, any uh, comorbidities. So I can't say to you, this is the dose, because for me, it would depend on the person sitting in front of me um, as to what we would um, advise. And can I just ask, Vicky, would you be expecting us to be doing that in our clinical practice at the moment or that to be referred on to our genetic centres? Yeah, I would I would be expecting actually uh, at the moment, even the genetic centres probably wouldn't be advising that. In my experience, if, say, a genetic counsellor has, has told a patient they've got Lynch, they will send the letter to the GP to prescribe the aspirin. But like Terry was explaining earlier, we don't we don't know how our practice is, is going to evolve in the future. Do you know what I mean? Maybe we will be the best placed to talk to our patients um, and things in the future. But I don't I don't want people watching this to think, oh my God, now you want me to prescribe aspirin. And it sounds really complicated. You know, don't worry about that. Um, it's just really saying to patients, gosh, you know, there have been studies aspirin has been shown to be effective you know here's this lovely decision aid go away and have a think about it um, and then we will um, speak to you know we can speak to your GP about prescribing it if that's for you do you see what I mean it's that yeah, sort of I do advice. thank you and it's it's just so helpful to know that the dilemmas that I think we're all having in clinical practice are you know you're the expert and, and it it's lovely to hear that from you uh, as well. So thank you. It's a re really helpful. I think we've had some, some more questions come in. Yeah, uh, somebody did just pop in the chat, which is relevant. Is the CAP study still ongoing? No, it's closed now, but I've, it's taking, obviously, I don't actually know when the results are due out, but it's taking a long time to analyse data and things. So um, no, we haven't got the results as yet. So watch this space Um, sort of following on a little bit from what you were just talking about, Claire, with the genetic centres. So um, somebody's asked, should we have a regional genetic service or genetic centre and how do we go about building that link with them? Yeah, everybody has a regional genetic centre and um, there are seven um, genomic laboratory hubs and they've all got um, an associated Genomic Medicine Service Alliance. Um, oh God, I know, so I'm sorry. It's, I didn't invent any of these titles, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Um, and of course, every um, area of the country has a regional genetics service where there'll be geneticists and genetic counsellors. So um, uh, we'll, give some, we'll give out some more information about that. And building links uh, will, I think, be really important moving forward as well. And hopefully now... Um, everybody, there should be a genomics champion in every single MDT. So go back, find out who your genomics champion is. And if there isn't one, please, 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 you do it. Do you know what I mean? All the <laughs> new nurses out there, you be the genomics champion because it gives you access to training and support um, and things. You know, there's a lot of money going into this at the moment. So this could be a real career opportunity for people um, to get involved in this, actually. So I, I urge everyone to go and, and, and get involved. Thank you. Um, somebody's put a, a question just in the chat there, Frank, um, to say, is it time to screen uh, for Lynch syndrome in colorectal cancer patients under bowel cancer screening age? Um, so the answer to that is it's already it already should be happening. So every single colorectal cancer patient in this country should be having their tumor tested, specialist staining for immunohistochemistry or MSI, depending on the area you're in, depends on what specialist staining is used. Um, and that initial test should indicate whether we should be worried about that patient. And then some of those patients will go on 
to have and be offered genetic testing. So actually another piece of homework is to go back to your MDT and make sure that all your patients um, are getting uh, that testing as well. It's been in nice guidance since 2016, but we know that getting it out has been problematic because of pathways, but the Lynch syndrome transformation project, this is its bread and butter, making sure that all cancers are being tested um, and you know, getting us all more aware and getting us trained up and providing an um, education for us. Uh, so there's lots and lots of um, resources out there for us to, uh, you know, get, in, get hold of at the moment. Vicky, can I ask, would you expect the MDT to discuss the result of that staining? Should this not be part of the MDT discussion? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, it should, I mean, certainly, um, I, I'm, I'm just wary because obviously I, I know how it works in my hospital and I, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but on our reports, all the reports at the bottom will say, uh, you know, deficient or proficient MMR. Um, and I don't want to overcomplicate that in some instances you go straight on genetic to genetic testing and in some instances you do one other little test and then you go on to genetic testing. So it should be being discussed you know, even briefly for, for all patients, um, yeah. And I think I'm right in saying that's part of the job of Lynch champions, isn't it? So yeah. as you were saying earlier, if you haven't got one, go and be one. Yeah, and this is where we can make a real difference as well. Yeah. Um, we've had another question come in from, from uh, um, Emily, I think. And it, no, from oh, no, another Vicky. So, sorry, from another Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. From another Vicky saying, uh, we're seeing younger patients with stage four metastatic disease, but normal MMR. Why would this be? Brilliant question. And I wish we knew the answer. So, even in, so the younger you are, the more likely there is to be an inherited element because it, your pathway to cancer has been much faster. And wouldn't it be wonderful? if we knew, do you know what I mean, if we picked up everybody. But actually, there's two things to say. The first thing to say is maybe every young patient does have, you know, an inherited component, but we, we just don't have the technology or the knowledge to find that out yet. So that's the first thing. And the second thing to say is there's something going on at the moment, isn't there? We know that there is an increasing incidence of early onset colorectal cancer in people under 50, but we do not always, um, we, don't, we don't know why that is. And it's definitely not due to just because people are, are doing the wrong thing, like smoking and, and um, not eating the right foods. We know that's not it, but unfortunately we don't have all the answers. So yes, some young patients, will have proficient MMR. We will not find a gene cause, even though they should all go on to genetic testing under 40. Um, we don't find a gene cause, and we don't know why they've got cancer at the moment. We just have to treat them with the knowledge we've got at the moment. That's great. Frustrating yeah. to leave you on a question that you weren't able to give a, a definitive answer to, but I guess that's the nature that's of... That's why it's so fascinating. <laughs> that's why it's such a fascinating part of our speciality. Absolutely. So we are very close to being out of time. So I just want to say an enormous thank you um, from all of us um, to you, Vicky, for your, your time in answering the questions and taking us through. And to you, Terry, as well, for um, your expertise um, and sharing this with us this afternoon. Um, there is a poll now. Um, I think we're repeating, aren't we, the, the, the poll on, on confidence on genomics. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's see if Anyone feels slightly better about it? Oh, oh, that's good. We've moved from the not at all confidence. Yeah, because that was 48% before. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I would have ticked number one. So I, uh, I, yeah. I think I'm up to, to maybe four now. So that's for a dinosaur like me, that's quite <laughs> a <good. laughs> so I would totally take that as, as, a, as a good job well done I think yeah, nobody absolutely. nobody is now on a one which Thank is great you. um so Terry I don't know did you want to ask a bit more about people's thoughts for our next session or are we well I think um I think from the questions we can kind of tailor the way the things people are thinking about I think 
uh, Lynch and the, the what Lynch means for us as colorectal nurses, I think is really important for us to explore in more detail because um, I think it is like this conversation now with the, the Ward sisters back in 1979. There's no way that this isn't going to improve outcomes for patients. It's going to under improve understanding, it's going to potentially improve quality of life and outcome. And uh, the, you, you know, this uh, is, is hugely important, I think, for us as specialist nurses. And at a time when we're all still, again, demonstrating our value, you know, we some of us will not have a title advanced health practitioner, um, and they, they seem to be getting all the focus at the moment, got uh, the title clinical nurse specialist, and it's, oh, yeah, but what do they do? They're not advanced practitioners. And actually you are, and this is yet more evidence of the absolutely essential part of your role um, in improving the care to the patient uh, throughout the whole part of the colorectal patient's pathway and more importantly to their family. Uh, so, you, so yeah, so it's really exciting. I think, Vicky, we've got some great planning to do for the, for the next uh, session. Um, yeah, brilliant. So well, well, fair, I, I'm thrilled to, to, to be here. I'm learning a lot. Um, and so thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Vicky, for demystifying genomics for us. Thank you. Only fair that you two have homework after you've set everyone else homework. Up. That's fair, <laughs> isn't it? Absolutely. So a huge, a huge thank you um, from all of us to both of you. Um, and I think there is, I think we have a slide um coming up now which is yes just a little bit of a shout out to part two and things beyond um part two so we've talked a lot today about the genomics part two um, there is a really super snazzy qr code there which we all tested yesterday so phones out um, scan it if you haven't already signed up and that should take you straight through um, to our website if it doesn't or you're not quick enough, um, then you can um, find it via our website. So that's the second one of our bite size um, learning sessions. Goodness. Okay, so then we also have um, dates for a couple more in the diary. So we have um, on Wednesday, the 13th of July, we have the evolution of pelvic exenteration surgery coming up. We then also in October are doing the management of anemia before colorectal cancer treatment. So they're both bite-sized sessions. And then we have our NCCNN annual education event uh, on Wednesday, the 14th of September. So that's when we will be doing the Gary Logue Awards as well for 2022. Um, so yes, some dates for the diary. So we really hope that you can join us. Um, and I'm sure you'll be hearing lots from our team 